Good evening, everybody. My name is Mel Callen, and I'm one of the founding members of the Penfield Green Initiative. With me here tonight are my co-founders. We have Deb Murator and Sue DeRosa. Sue Pixley is in the audience, and Peter Maurer is in the back, and we're all part of the steering committee for the Penfield Green Initiative. Um, we have a sign-up list if you'd like to uh, join us on our email. Deb puts out an email newsletter once a month. You won't be bombarded with our, with our news items, just a one concise newsletter. And uh, to contact us, you can reach us at penfieldgreen at gmail.com or at Facebook, Penfield Green Initiative. And on the table there is information about some of the um, programs that we've had in the past, so we'd love to have you join us at least on our email. Certainly if you want to join us in our committee, we'd be more than welcome to have you. Um, we have a couple more members who couldn't make it here tonight, but um, Kate um, McArdle is one of them. And then we have some, a few of the uh, member emeritus, as we call them because they're active in, in some ways, but had to resign from, officially from the committee. Um, also tonight, before I introduce our uh, speakers for the evening, we have a couple of guests joining us. One is a Penfield, um, the Penfield Victory Garden, and they describe themselves as, as uh, Penfield Town residents who enjoy gardening together on a 3.3 acre parcel of land on Five Mile Line Road in Penfield. You may have seen it. I know I have when I've gone up and down Five Mile Line. Each gardener can rent a seven by 16 um, foot bed for $35 within the garden to cultivate. And gardeners may have up to two beds and two beds are $50. So there's a display in the back, a couple of folks, Dot and some others here from the Penfield uh, Victory Garden if you want to ask questions about that. Last we heard, Dot, there are about 15 beds available. And the contact is the Recreation Department on Baird Road, 340-8655. And that's for the Penfield uh, Victory Garden. And I have here Lori Bricola who's going to talk about their uh, Lawn and Garden Center. Lori, a couple minutes for you. Thanks, Mel. It's great to see this many people even come out on this horrible snowy March day. I'm getting so sick of it. I don't know about the rest of you. But um, I'm kind of new to Penfield even though my business has uh, been over 20 years doing lawn and tree care services. IPM specifically um, the approach that you're going to hear about today and um, working with Cornell recommendations and all that for years and years but what um, brought me to Penfield is we bought Countryway Garden Center down the road on Route 441 and we've just changed the name to Brocolo it's just been one year Brocolo Garden Center we specialize in a lot of native plantings um, the Victory Garden gets some nice offers for um, purchases, things like that, and um, we just hope to see you all there. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lori. Yeah, you're right. It's hard to think of spring planting and these kinds of things on a snowy night like tonight, but we thank all of you for coming. And we are very fortunate to have uh, two wonderful speakers with us tonight. Uh, we have Brian Eschenauer, an extension educator Cornell's, uh, at Cornell's New York State Integrated Pest Management Program. And that's what tonight's speak, uh, presentation is about, integrated pest management. And Brian is an IPM, of course it stands for Integrated Pest Management, specialist for ornamental crops in New York. In this position, he works closely with Cornell faculty, extension educators, and growers to bring research-based information and pest control solutions to greenhouse, nursery producers, as well as landscape professionals. He earned his bachelor's degree in horticulture from Delaware Valley College and a master of science degree in plant pathology from North Carolina State University. Brian's work career has focused on plant disease diagnoses with an emphasis on turf grass, trees, and shrubs. In addition, Brian's work through Cornell Extension involves insect and weed identification and their management in ornamental settings. Next, we have uh, Lynn Brayburn. Lynn, a certified wildlife bio biologist, joined the New York State Community IPM program in May 1999 as an extension educator. From 1986 through 1997, Lynn was a company vice president and franchise owner manager with Critter Control, Inc., 
which is the nation's leading firm specializing in nuisance wild, wildlife control. He has been an active participant and leader in both state and national vertebrate pest control organizations. Lynn has also taught several college biology courses since 1980. Since joining the community IPM program, Lynn has had major responsibilities in assisting New York State schools and municipalities in the implementation of IPM, Integrated Pest Management. As a volunteer, Lynn regularly runs U.S. Geological Survey breeding bird survey routes and participates on the management committee of a private wetland preserve. Thank you both very much for joining us tonight, and we uh, look forward to your presentation. Lynn, I understand you're going first. Yes. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Brian and I, our, our offices are in the County Extension Building on Highland Avenue, and the uh, master gardeners on their gardening hotline have been feeling calls lately, people wondering about this huge ice mass meeting in the north, and gardeners complain about mammoths, and saber-toothed tigers taking young dogs, and things like that. But it's uh, I will be giving a, um, first, a, a very brief introduction to what integrated pest management is about in terms of the concept of integrated pest management. And then uh, my area of specialty is with IPM pest management and buildings. So I'll be talking, giving a general framework for that. And uh, probably won't have too much time except for using some specific examples to get into a lot of details on particular pests, but in the Q&A, we could do that. And then Brian will uh, talk about um, um, IPM and lawns. Okay, integrated pest management. Okay, what in the world is this long term? Well, it can be defined as a systematic and proactive approach to pest management. It provides for better pest management while reducing the need for pesticide use. And as our colleague, uh, Dr. Jody Gangloff Kaufman, uh, station Long Island, has said more than once, that IPM is about a process. It doesn't focus necessarily on a product. And uh, this is a, uh, uh, another description which I like. We, uh, together with the DEC under an EPA grant over a, about a dozen years ago, uh, wrote this uh, workbook, uh, IPM workbook for New York State schools with a simple definition for IPM that at its most basic, IPM is a common sense pest control strategy based on two simple tenets. Treat only when necessary and use the safest available alternative to do the job. Thus, in practice, IPM involves careful monitoring of pests and the use of a wide range of methods to exclude, remove, drive away, or kill pests with the least possible hazard to people, property, and the environment. So there's two simple tenets. Treat only when necessary and use the safest available alternative when you do that. And I would like to add a third tenet, and that's preventing pest problems as much as possible. Okay, this is what uh, we refer to as the IPM pyramid. It's just a um, another way of um, uh, pictorially sh um, a, um, showing the IPM concept, where the base of the pyramid is where you spend most of your time. And we'll be talking about that. Uh, I know tr um, Brian's going to talk a lot of that uh, in regards to, uh, to turf. And uh, uh, then when you need to, to deal dr uh, directly with pests, the, uh, as you go up the tiers, that's in the order of preference. Okay. And you see the, on the, the left that uh, down the bottom of the pyramid where hopefully you're spending most of your time, uh, you're focusing on prevention and as you go up the pyramid then you're putting more in intervention. And also the relative level of risk tends to rise as you see in the, on the, the right draft or the right arrow. Okay, well what is a pest? Couple definition. Well a pest is a living organism. And it's really not so much the type of organism itself, but rather the situation which the organism is in. Okay. And so I have a few examples here. Uh, so like uh, it may be a situation where it's causing property damage, it's is termite damage uh, in this situation. Another uh, example of causing damage is eating or contaminating our food. So the house mouse and the cockroach are good illustrations of, uh, of that. Uh, health risks, human health risks, and um, uh, again, we can point to these two guys again, especially this guy. And, uh, uh, and also just detracts from our aesthetics and comfort. And so, you know, weeds going along the school here also, and um, 
and his, you know, our friends the Canada geese on his ball field. So what is a pesticide? Interesting enough, there's a lot of misconceptions about what a pesticide actually is. Well, this is the actual technical de definition. You can trace it back to federal regulations that a pesticide is any substance or mixture of substances intended for preventing, destroying, repelling, or mitigating uh, any pest. And so a pesticide is just not insect sprays. Um, <clears throat> weed killers, more technically herbicides, are pesticides. Um, mouse poison, more uh, technically rodenticides, are, um, are, are, are pesticides. And it doesn't necessarily have to kill the pest. You see, <laughs> repelling or mitigating. So chemical repellents are registered pesticides, at least the legal ones. And uh, bactericides also, um, which we use in sanitizers, um, are uh, technically pesticides, although they're regulated differently than most other pesticides. So what I want to focus on now, and most of the remainder of my presentation, is what I refer to as the three, in quote, laws for keeping your home pest free. And again, we probably all recognize that that's the ideal, the goal. Never having a pest in your home uh, won't happen, but you know, how do I reduce uh, <coughs> the, the chances? And, and these three laws are sanitation, exclusion, and communication. And this is important whether you're dealing with an individual house or a large complex like this town hall or a school campus. <coughs> First of all, I look at sanitation. Just a few comments, uh, examples of sanitation. In pest management, when we're talking about sanitation of pest in structures and buildings, uh, we're referring to this triad, food, water, and harborage. Harborage means simply a place for the pest to live. Okay. Um, so when we're doing sanitation with, from a pest management point of view, we're eliminating or reducing these so that if pests do come into the, the building, it's not likely that they'll be able to get established. And again, this is sanitation from the pest point of view. Um, a cockroach or mouse could care less if the middle of this room is clean. They want to know what's behind things in what we refer to as these little cracks and crevices where they want to live. Particularly important that there not be food for the pests left overnight because most pests of buildings are nocturnal critters. And so it's particularly important, again, that food and garbage is not left accessible to pests overnight. Um, there should be regular deep cleaning. You know, the old idea of spring cleaning. Uh, we, I work, again, a lot with schools, and so we emphasize that a lot with schools. And essentially what that means is you've got to move the heavy stuff on a schedule. <clears throat> and for storage, again, from a pest management point of view, especially where there's food, and again, in schools, uh, commercial kitchens, it's particularly important that uh, uh, storage in food areas be off the floor and away from the wall. Okay. That accomplishes at least two things. It allows you to better, well, at least three things, keep things better organized, um, uh, fewer places for pests to hide, and also allows you to inspect better. And just a few examples here of, of uh, sanitation in, in practice. Um, and again, most of these are with schools, since that's where I spend most of my time. But uh, we do care when we're thinking about the building, what's going on, on the outside of the building. From, from the building pest point of view, we talk about that as being pest pressure. How do we manage the perimeter of the building to reduce the pest pressure against that building? And so <clears throat> and, um, this school, we have this partial weeds, partial bush, bushes, right of growing against the wall. And again, you, you, you cannot um, inspect that easily to see if there's any gaps in the mortar or other cracks that pests can be using to get in. And also it's a place for pests to hide. Okay, increases the pest pressure against the outside of the wall. And so what the school has done is remove a barrier. We recommend that you know, it's at least a, a, a barrier of a, or of at least a foot wide of a minimum of vegetation you know, the least vegetation, the least stuff against the side of the, of the structure, the less press pre pest pressure you will have on the structure. Um, 
again, just accessible food. Uh, this was food left over um, a summer break in a home economics classroom. And so particularly places where food is left for a long period of time, there isn't a turnover of food, that in increases the likelihood of pests getting established. This is pretty interesting. This, th th this is a cake in a hotel room. It's a hotel room where we were having an IPM meeting. And these are all little, these, all these little dots are ants. And uh, uh, so the hotel staff regularly brought cakes there, and the ants knew it. So as soon as that cake was there, the ants came out. And so, you know, there was a, this is the result of lack of sanitation with a, a feeding pattern established uh, with the local ants. Uh, one common place for structural pests is, off, is often a, is under sinks because they have a, uh, uh, often a source to moisture. Uh, the pipe chases go into the walls, gives them highways to go from, from the wall voids out into the room. And uh, not uncommonly food in there too. So when we're doing inspections and you, yeah, uh, the, these cavities underneath sinks is a good place to look. Again, this is emphasizing a good point. This is again, in, this is in a school cafeteria looking underneath the uh, uh, large commercial uh, uh, refrigerators that you've got to think like the pest. You know, uh, this individual can't do an inspection for pests by just walking down the middle of the floor. You got to look for where, where they occur. Okay. Um, vending machines, again, for homes. I'm sure we're not dealing with vending machines, but that's the, but in a place like this, the, you know, the, the town hall, definitely schools, definitely, is that often a, um, a, a a source of problems for pests because of the source of food, crumbs, often water from condensation from the plumbing associated with that, and shelter. And these things are heavy, so they don't tend to be moved a lot. Okay. Uh, this is a janitorial closet in a school. And, uh, you know, if we were honest, we could have probably, many of us find places in our home that look like this. Okay. This is what we, in the pest, in, uh, in pest control world, we call clutter. And uh, just gives for, uh, a lot of places for pests to hide if they get established, and makes it very, very difficult to, to look for and inspect for those pests. Again, this, this dumpsters, again, in a school situation, but uh, the idea that uh, reducing pest pressure against the outside of the structure and garbage management. Uh, a, a good homeowners, for schools we say the further that the dumpsters are away from the kitchen doors or the outside doors, the, the, the less pest pressure that they have. You know, the janitorial staff, they, they often don't like walking the extra amount, but they definitely reduce the, the yellow jackets, flies, uh, et cetera, et cetera, which would, can come into the kitchen area and have access to the food. Um, a modification of this or an a, a, um, application of this for the homeowner is, again, how uh, readily available is the garbage on the street for your weekly pickup? You know, is it out there all week? <clears throat> I just put mine out the night before pickup. Again, this idea of reducing pest pressure against that out outside building and uh, uh, so organic debris, which is built up around the foundation, moisture around the foundation, um, all contributes to uh, several different types of pests being associated with that foundation more easily finding their way in. <clears> okay, <throat> going to the next, uh, uh, some examples of the, the second of these three major laws on uh, how to make your home pest-free, exclusion. Okay, by exclusion, we're talking, of course, about closing those openings that pests can use. And I, you know, encourage just regular exterior in inspections. You know, building materials, they, with our weather, they expand and shrink, so there's always gaps which are occurring. And so a good time just to give a once around the outside of your house and look for openings to close are fall and spring. Okay, just put that on your, on your schedule. <clears throat> Save yourself a lot of headaches. You're looking not only for present problems, but future problems. Uh, maybe there's a particular vent that right now there's no signs of pest entry, but, it, but it's a vulnerable vent. You know, is there something they could do with that vent to reduce the possibility of it becoming um, a pest entry point uh, in the future before the problem occurs? 
and use appropriate materials. And you need somewhat of a knowledge, of course, uh, uh, for example, like weep holes uh, in the foundations that are meant to be there. You can't close those off, but there are, but there are screens, um, even a, um, uh, uh, a type of foamy type screen that can be put into those holes. <coughs> Okay, some examples, again, with schools, but you can think about them how they may apply to their home. Um, whoops. Okay, this is a sink, and there's a, a, a sealant, not a caulk, but a sealant, which, which closes a gap between that sink and the wall. And so what that does is eliminate places that, for example, cockroaches could live and a variety of other types of pests insect pests. Again, on the exterior, we have some water erosion going on, including a, a gap um, through, through the foundation in, in an old pipe chase. And so this, this would contribute you know, to you know, the degradation of that foundation, uh, and maybe some more serious problems besides just a pest entry point. But it also, um, obviously, is a, a source of freestanding water, which would increase pest pressure against the exide. Also think about the openings on the inside. This is an interior wall. The, the kitchen's right on the other side of the school. And a mouse did not make that hole in the cinder block. It was punched in for some other reason and left, uh, but a mouse regularly uses that. The kitchen staff stuffed their napkin in it, thinking that would keep the mouse out. But it just helped us nice to show the mouse droppings and the rub marks from the mouse fur, you know, to, uh, <laughs> uh, but cinder blocks, and of course many of our foundations are made of cinder blocks, they're, especially mouse condominiums. You know, each, each mouse gets their own apartment. <laughs> uh, and some examples of uh, exclusion. This is a use of an of a expanding foam gun, which is about uh, five times uh, easier and nicer to use than the cans you get at the, um, at the hardware store. You get them from building supply companies and pest supply uh, control supply companies, too. Uh, gaps associated with uh, uh, this bay door, which can allow pests in. This idea of, is look for and take care of those exterior openings, okay, before you have a, a press problem. And um, uh, then just closing, closing open like pipe chases underneath the sink uh, is good for internal exclusion for uh, reducing those highways that, pe that pests can use to move around within the building and also reduces those uh, places that they can live. Okay, um, the third law then, not going to spend a lot of time on this right now when we're working with schools, we need this more systematic, but for everybody in the household, they've got to be on board. Okay, it's communication. So, the key to, to our IPM is that it provides better pest control while we're reducing or eliminating risks associated with the dependence on pesticides. That's what we want to get away from, is depending upon pesticides. Because if we're just applying, applying, applying a pesticide for the same problem, you are not solving a problem. <laughs> OK, um, during the Q&A, uh, we may want to look at some of these. Um, if you like, we're getting me to look at a I have very brief uh, slideshows. It might be easy just to describe. Um, these are s some of the more common um, household pests. Occasional invaders, that's the lingo within uh, structural pest management. We refer to box elder bugs, cluster flies, uh, ladybugs, uh, things, uh, things like that, that can't, can't reproduce in our homes, but they like to come in, especially in the winter. And of course, the guy on the, the radar screen is the brown marmalade stink bug, uh, which I have a specimen of. Which, uh, um, uh, the, uh, of these, though, that the, I'll, I'll only discuss the uh, if no one else is interested in any of the others, is bed bugs. Because I know, you know, everybody wants to know about bed bugs, which is good, but uh, with the exception of, of one aspect, bed bugs is, is not really associated with how we manage the building, per se. Brian? <laughs> yeah, any quick questions while Brian? Uh... Excuse me, while we're, because we're taping, why don't we have you talking to the mic? 
where I didn't see spiders on that list, uh -huh. um, are they would be considered advantageous? In our area, we probably put them in the occasional invaders group. You know, we get down with the brown recluse and things like that, and there's definitely health risks, but we really don't have to worry about that up here. Um, uh, but when it comes to spiders, it's, more, it's a lot in the eye of the beholder. So, you know, I usually leave them alone unless the spider web, you know, is in my, li is in my corner of the, <laughs> in the living room for aesthetic reasons. But, uh, uh, you know, some people would prefer that they not have any spiders in their house. But you aren't, you know, if you're depending on spiders to control any pests that come into your house, yeah, that's not going to work. Okay. <laughs> any other questions? Does anybody else have problems with stink bugs lately? The box, they're called box elders? No, they're different. They're different. Yeah, in oh. fact, I have a specimen of the brown marbled stink bug. The brown marbled stink bug is a, is a um, box elder bug is a native pest, although it's not native to the east. It's, it, it moved east with the box elder tree as we cleared the forest. But, um, uh, uh, but the brown marbled stink bug is an Asian uh, bug, which it has, has uh, devastated a wide variety of agricultural crops in the mid-Atlantic states and has become a, a massive occasional invader, you know, in those states, Pennsylvania, Maryland, places like that, just invading homes by the thousands. And, um, uh, we, we have them in New York State, but they haven't, uh, I, maybe the ones we have are just scouts in front of the advancing horde, but we don't. And now we're going to take a look at the outside. Uh, a little bit about turf grass, some other new diseases, and a little bit about some insects. So uh, we'll get started here. Lawns are an important part. It's probably one place where the most inputs are put in um, around our landscapes for pest control, for fertilizer. So we'll take a look at that from the start, and then we'll go from there. Um, and we'll talk about pests and other problems. Sometimes. It's not a pest, and you have to figure out what the underlying cause is. And Lynn was talking about that. There's a lot of cultural things you can do, um, changing the situation so pests aren't invited, or finding out what is stressing it. And uh, we're taking a look at this um, uh, development here, and this is, was taken in April. The turf was looking horrible here. Is it a pest? Should we control it? Should we apply a pesticide? Well, we kind of have to go back in time to figure out what caused this. And you may have some ideas. This may help a little bit more. I took this last year uh, along a sidewalk. And uh, can you tell now? This is salt. Yeah, yeah. So you, you kind of got that there. And, and this was actually a salt spray, too, that came off of the road <coughs> there and into the development. It was after a particularly snowy year. A lot of salt was used, and we didn't have as much rain that spring to wash it through the profile. It actually killed some of the turf there. So there's some strategies we can use, including using an annual grass in that area right near the, uh, the sidewalk or the roadway. And uh, there it is. This is actually taken on uh, Cornell's campus where they have that issue as well. And a lot of salt is used. It's important um, to use for safety of the pedestrians there. But it's also uh, something that can be a problem for plants. It can be a problem for trees and, as we saw, for turf grass there. And what happens along roadways a lot of times is, um, especially where the cars are traveling faster, an aerosol gets created with that salt. And this mist of salt and slush uh, can travel several feet, especially with uh, air movement. Uh, a little breeze can uh, cause it to drift over into the plantings. Here you can see some plants are more susceptible than others. This is white pine. It's uh, pretty susceptible to salt spray. You can see this is right along um, a roadway, and that drifted over and caused this uh, browning here. There are some trees, though, that are resistant to that. A lot of the uh, conifers that are grown in coastal areas uh, take the sea salt spray and are resistant. One that happens to be resistant is Austrian pine and that'll do real well along roadways. Another site that we can see, and you can see this uh, if you're traveling along 490, is this uh, symptom here where there's a proliferation of branches at the end. It's called a witch's broom. 
And it's also due to that salt spray. Again, some of these deciduous trees that lose their leaves are more susceptible than others. Um, and if you're planting in a site where you might get salt spray, yeah, it's a good um, idea to check and get those salt resistant trees to uh, locate in that spot. And this can cause weak branching besides kind of looking ugly in the winter landscape. Um, it can cause a poor structure and uh, the trees could uh, break apart easier in a snow event and maybe become a hazard. Um, and it happens in two ways. The uh, tip, uh, the end terminal bud there uh, is actually desiccated from the salt that uh, lands there. And also some of the salt that lands in the root zone is taken up by the tree and gets deposited right at the end and kills the bud there. This was taken in my lawn a couple years ago and this is snow mold and we might see that this year especially if snow lasts until mid-March when it starts to get a little bit warm here. This is actually a fungus. These patches are uh, patches of fungi that are growing there. They, uh, this fungus can only grow in temperatures slightly above freezing and with very high humidity. So the conditions are those that you can find underneath the snow, especially in the springtime. Um, this is just a fungus. It, uh, when temperatures start to warm up, it kind of balls up and uh, forms these structures that survive in the soil all summer long. And then if the conditions are right, and we don't see this every year, it can develop. These actually germinate like seeds, fungal seeds, and um, can kill it. But is there anything we need to do if you see this? Uh, really, no. This is um, another portion of a lawn that was affected by the snow mold. The lawns, in most cases, will grow right through it. If it's a newly planted lawn or a very high maintenance lawn, that may be a different story. You might want to look into uh, some preventative measures there, but in most cases for 95% of our home lawn areas, um, just recognizing that it's something that will pass. Uh, you can rake up these areas and um, it'll allow the lawn to grow through it a little bit quicker. All right, the number one cause of thin or poor turf grass, does anybody know we get these calls in the uh, um, office and that is shade. Uh, turf grass needs a certain amount of sunlight to, um, to grow well. And um, often it'll be, but I used to have really good grass and then, and now I don't, and what's wrong? Well, um, as a homeowner might not notice the incremental growth, but trees grow bigger each year and they cast more shade each year. Also, there's some competition with the tree roots and the turf grass roots, but mostly it is the fact that sunlight's not getting through to this area here. So um, what do you do about that? Well, if you have um, your choice, you're thinking of maybe replacing if a tree is getting too big. Um, there are trees that allow uh, grass to grow under them because their canopy lets light go through. Norway maple is one that casts the most shade for the trees that we grow in the Northeast. Uh, there's not a tree that captures as much sunlight and uh, causes heavy shade. And this is looking up through the canopy. You can see there's very few spots here where the average Norway maple would allow sunlight through compared to a honey locust where we have these big places where shafts of light can get through to the ground and we have some nice turf growing there underneath the honey locust. There are lots of other examples that uh, where turf and trees are compatible. Here's a larch. This one actually loses its needles each fall, but uh, has a very open canopy and grass is growing just fine under there. So managing turf in the shade. Uh, well, if you are trying and it's a light shade, you can use a turf grass called fine fescue. It's a whole group of grasses that um, do well in the shade. Um, but it's possible that it's even too much shade for these shade tolerant grasses. So um, you can think about if you have a stand of trees, maybe thinning that stand out to allow light in if turf grass is important to you. Um, or uh, you could have an arborist come in and cut selective branches out to allow uh, sunlight to reach the ground below to support the turf grass. Or um, consider eliminating the turf. Why fight it? You have the trees you like, 
think about a different ground cover there. Here, uh, among, uh, below these uh, white pine trees, they just took uh, and edged um, here a nice edge and allowed the mulch to be the ground cover, and that's actually pine needles that fall naturally there. And some that fall out on the lawn get raked back into that area. So instead of really trying to get grass growing in that shaded area, um, they just went with what was natural there. There are lots of ground covers that are a possibility. Hostas uh, can grow in the shade. Uh, English ivy and pachysandra also do really well in very, very low light that will not support turf grass. And I'll just mention for a second, we have the handouts here, and I'll leave some here um, at the town hall that uh, you could pick up later. But uh, we have this uh, publication of weed suppressive ground covers. Some of these do real well in the shade. And um, these are some of, some of these um, plants um, emit some natural herbicides, so they're naturally controlling uh, weeds when they're planted in groups. All right, so the most important maintenance practice for thicker turf and for fewer weeds is mowing, believe it or not. We're going to talk about why that is um, and the practices that we recommend. And this is based on a lot of research really to suppress weeds. Leaving the turf at three inches or, or higher does a great job. Um, it just doesn't allow the weed seeds to get in and germinate when you have a, a higher canopy like that. And um, a lot of people like to go a little lower, um, used to seeing putting greens on TV with the golf, but those are specialized situations and require a lot of input. Also, we want to say leave the clippings because you can fertilize less. The clippings really melt pretty quickly in the lawn. They quickly become organic matter. And um, with them left there, you have everything you need for new uh, grass blades. And it's actually a natural fertilizer. And keep the mowing uh, blade sharp. Um, that actually eliminates uh, some water loss. I like this slide, just it shows you that if you cut really low, your maintenance level will increase. So the shorter the blade, the higher the maintenance. And that's because your roots are shorter. There is an impact to the plant uh, when it is cut so short. Um, it can't support as many roots. And then your maintenance level increases. You, you need uh, to water more often. You need more fertilizer. Um, and you're more susceptible to pest invasion if you have a shorter blade. So keeping it at three inches or higher uh, makes it a lot easier to maintain a healthy turf. And we have some of these guides to hand out. Uh, just as a reminder, you could use a ruler, but this is kind of a nice guide. It has some tips on the back that just uh, serve as a reminder that uh, the ideal cutting height is about three inches. And the dull mower blade, if you haven't sharpened your mower blade in a while, it's a really good idea because um, the dull mower blade of our common rotary mowers um, beats the ends of the grass blade and frays them uh, apart and you lose more moisture, the turf is more stressed, it becomes more susceptible to pests and they actually I have found an increased fuel use because it's harder to push, it's slower, um, it takes more effort for that blade to go around um, for the mower. So to be efficient, make sure, um, depending on the size of your yard, it's every year or um, every other year, the uh, folks that go around and, and mow lawns, they're doing it once a week or more often. Um, and a reminder, uh, there's some research recently out of Michigan State, and it tells us that uh, the mulch leaves are actually good for the lawn. Um, they, in some cases, can reduce the weeds as well, putting that layer of mulch there as a barrier for weed seeds. This is just uh, a shot to show you that you can take a pretty thick layer. It is possible to overwhelm a mower, so you know if you have several inches, uh, you'd want to rake 
uh, that up, but uh, otherwise you can mow it and you'll have these little bits that'll quickly filter in through the grass blades and just become organic matter there in the lawn. So just as a reminder, mowing right, you can say three inches or higher, um, mulch the clippings and the leaves, have a sharp mower blade, and uh, if you're going to mow like this, wear a helmet. <laughs> wear a helmet. They actually have a lawnmower races. Do you know there's a circuit for lawnmower races? There really is. Um, some fertilizer tips. Timing is everything. Um, and we'll have reminders really soon during the NCAA basketball tournaments. They, I think uh, some of the lawn care, the national companies start advertising that uh, you should fertilize now. It's a little bit on the early side in March, especially with the frozen soil out there to start uh, fertilizing for us here in the Rochester area. So we want to pay attention to when is the right time of year to fertilize. And some of it is the expectation of your lawn. If you have a very um, high expectations, golf course type uh, lawn, maybe you're going to fertilize four times a year. Um, if it's more scaled back, you have some kids running around, you want to fertilize a little bit to make sure it's a healthy, uh, thick turf, and you're fertilizing a couple times a year. Then uh, the first time of the year would be around May. We don't want to fertilize too early to feed this fire of a lot of top growth that occurs. And you know, if you are mowing your own lawn, uh, it's hard to keep up with the lawn in late April, May, maybe even through the beginning of June because it's growing so quickly. So if we wait until mid-May, that's going to meter things out a little bit. It's uh, going to help the lawn there. It'll help it through the summer. During the summer period where maybe the lawn goes dormant, uh, unless you're irrigating, it's not a good time uh, to fertilize during the summer stress period because the grasses that we grow in the Northeast are cool season grasses, and they grow the most in the spring and in the fall. Another good time to fertilize is right here in September, maybe mid-August through September. Um, that will contribute to good root growth at that time. And uh, looking at a bag of fertilizer, we won't get into all the detail here, but we will talk about the most important um, nutrient for turf grass growth. It's really key is nitrogen. And you'll see that as the first number on the bag. And then phosphorus and potassium, we're only going to use those as needed. And hopefully most of the phosphorus is at zero right now uh, because um, that can contribute to some pollution in our waterways. And just as a reminder, um, June and uh, September, if you're using uh, holidays around Memorial Day or prior to and uh, before or right around Labor Day are good times to shoot for for that lawn fertilization. Also when you're fertilizing, it makes sense to pay attention to the weather. If you see a big storm like this, maybe you wouldn't be out there anyway, but uh, if you know one is for forecasted, uh, avoid the application before a heavy rain because the uh, rain could move those fertilizer pellets away from the lawn and into our storm sewers that go directly into our waterways. We're going to uh, lightly water it in so that they filter down in to the grass where they can be used as opposed to sitting up there on the blades. And uh, we want to avoid using a highly water soluble fertilizer. So you'll see some that are um, slow release those are really good choices to use. And the type of um, applicator makes a difference. There's a drop spreader and rotary spreaders. And I think you can guess that this is not a good place for a rotary spreader because it uh, flings the fertilizer pellets out to the side. And we have a very narrow uh, strip here that, that's being fertilized. And we really hate to see this pellets on a hard surface because unless these are swept back into the lawn, those will, through rainfall, go into the storm sewers 
and into creeks and our waterways. I hate to see that because they can take nutrients that encourages algae growth. Um, so the rotary swath is this wide, not going to want that on this thin strip of lawn. And this can occur too, though, right along um, a sidewalk or a driveway, getting it there. And it, it's okay if you, you see it's there, sweeping it back into the lawn, we'll take care of it. But if you don't, uh, we're going to do this right here. Don't want to see that. Um, and sometimes we'll, we'll see these reminders out there that yeah, what goes into the storm through sewer doesn't get processed. It goes right into the streams and for us into Lake Ontario. So there are lots of pollutants and this is kind of the, the bad side where we can see um, clippings and uh, other things, fertilizer going right into that storm sewer. Um, and this is why it's important here. Um, we have lawns. We have our waterways that we want to keep healthy. We had a program called Great Lawns, Great Lakes, where we learned a lot about this. And some of the practices I'm talking about are based on that. This is what we hate to see, the algae building up. And it's not the algae, actually, that causes the problem. But when the algae starts to die, it uses up oxygen. That's where fish can be killed, where bacteria can build up so that the beaches, for example, can be closed. So there's a lot of good things we can do. Here he is using a drop spreader instead of that rotary one, um, measuring the amount of rainfall or the irrigation that's taking place, keeping the clippings out of the storm sewer too, and the leaves. Um, leaves actually have phosphorus in them, so keeping those off the street is a great idea. Um, if you are going to water, and here's a, a lawn that is dormant. And it's okay to allow our lawns to go dormant. They can stay dormant for about five weeks, and there's no implication on the health of the turf. They'll pop out of that as soon as we get rainfall. An indication that they're dormant is the um, footprints stay after you walk over it because there's not the water pressure there in the blades to pop those blades back up. But uh, if you choose to water, there are some guidelines. It's a good idea to water. Uh, early in the day, avoid the heat of midday. You can lose as much as 30% of the water directly to evaporation, so it's never making it down into the, the grass roots um, that can use that, so uh, avoid midday watering. Also, determine the amount of water by collecting. Have something out there so that you're not overwatering or uh, underwatering, and the amount would be about an inch uh, per week. So if you collect an inch in here, you're done for the week. And this can depend. If you have a very sandy soil, um, you probably only want to do a half an inch at a time because it will go through the profile pretty quickly. Um, and if you have a clay soil, it may not need as much because the clay particles really hold on to the water well. All right, we have uh, some time to talk about some landscape pests moving away from lawns there a little bit, and uh, some of the diseases that we may see. First one is tar spot, and you may recognize it here on the left, that spot there on our Norway maple leaves. And the symptoms are the black spots. It's caused by a fungus, and uh, this is what it may look like at this time of year. So we'll kind of go through what's going on with this disease uh, through the year. So after the snow melts, you might see an old leaf from last year that has a uh, spot on it. And from that spot, spores will come out. And those spores will come out only when the leaves are expanding. So there'll be small leaves early in the spring. And if there's moisture at that time, um, those spores, like seeds, will germinate. And they'll go through. This is representing the leaf surface here. They'll go through, and they'll start to infect the leaf. And then early on in May and June, we really can't see anything there. It takes a while for this fungus to grow, even though the infection took place in April, early May. It's not until uh, about July when we first start to see these yellow spots and then a little bit of black spots. Those black spots eventually will grow together until we see the characteristic tar spot that this disease is um, named for. So there it is. Um, this is one where 
it's not going to affect the overall health of the tree so you can tolerate this and uh, just know that the tree will be all right you can plant a different type of maple that doesn't get this tar spot doesn't get as severe or a different type of tree altogether um, removing the leaves will help to some extent because those spores do come out of the leaves the following spring so it can reduce the load of spores that may be in the air however uh, there are a lot of norway maple trees in our communities so those spores can travel um, so it's not going to completely eliminate it even if you get all the leaves from your lawn and i will mention that you can compost these leaves and the spots break down pretty quickly so it's not one you have to be concerned about that way research was done on that recently and uh, Fungicide sprays could be used. I don't know of anybody who's doing that in uh, the Rochester area because um, it doesn't threaten the health of the tree. And um, it's only an aesthetic issue that really shows up late in the season. All right, moving on to another disease. And this one is brand new to us uh, that really just affected our area in 2012. And this affects impatiens. And impatiens uh, for a long time have been the number one bedding plant uh, because they do well um, in the Northeast. They can tolerate shade better than any other annual flower that we put out. And there's lots of different colors to them. However, um, there, uh, this showed up this year in Pittsburgh, Long Island, everywhere in between. Um, there's this disease called downy mildew. It was in Europe for several years. It moved over. It was in some small locations in 2010 and 2011. This year, it really uh, broke out and was a problem throughout the area. There's a lot of greenhouse growers who are not producing uh, impatiens and some that aren't producing as much because it's anticipated that this will be an annual problem. And um, uh, I'll show you some more slides. This is what it can look like in the beginning. It doesn't look like much of a problem, but if you flip the leaves over, there it is. This um, water mold uh, has produced spores on the underside of the leaves, and those can travel through the air and infect healthy plants. This was in um, Rochester, a couple of spots that had uh, severe defoliation due to this disease. And as I mentioned, it is a water mold, and these little spores are airborne. The good news is it doesn't affect New Guinea patients. They aren't as shade tolerant, but um, you know they're going to be one of the plants that people are looking at as a substitute. And um, yeah, it is spread by those airborne spor spores, as I mentioned. So we could imagine these spores coming through the air. Unfortunately, they're not big enough for us to see them and they don't travel in clouds like this. But uh, the, the point here is you can have a completely healthy planting that you got the greenhouse grower, wherever you got them from the garden center, did a great job. However, uh, these spores come through the air and can affect those healthy plants. And that's what happened in a big way in 2012. And this is what some of the plants look like in the landscape. Here it was in July. This was actually in 2011 in some of those early cases. And this was on Long Island. And then by September, and they don't have a frost there, well into October, um, you saw this kind of devastation there where the, uh, the leaves were um, defoliated. And looking at the leaves that remain, can do this yourself and if you see a white cottony material there it is the downy mildew fungus um, impatiens were used a lot in landscapes um, most of the commercial uh, companies are not using impatiens anymore because of this and uh, in 2012 in this planting they used marigolds is that the best choice uh, probably not they need a little more sun but we're still figuring out what the optimum substitutes for imp impatiens are going to be. Here's just another case um, with impatiens uh, that yeah, a month later, the weeds are growing, but the impatiens um, didn't make it. So this is why 
things are going to be different in 2012 if you grew impatient in the past. As I mentioned, New Guinea's uh, don't get downy mildew. And uh, begonias are safe as well. Lots of uh, opportunities there for other bedding plants to use for this year. And I'll finish up with uh, this one. It's a disease that's very similar to the um, impatience downy mildew. This is also a water mold type of organism, and it's late blight. And this affects tomatoes and potatoes. In 2009, we had a severe outbreak of this. And in fact, if you were growing them in that year, you probably lost your plants unless you were using something to protect them. There is a nice website that's available now because this affected growers. Um, this is primarily geared towards them, but they welcome homeowners to use this. Um, if you go on usablight.org, um, this is a multi-state effort, and you can see where late blight is occurring. So if you see it's occurring in a neighboring county, then you may want to um, start treating your plants. There's a couple of fungicides that can be used. There's even an organic option that's a copper-based fungicide that uh, organic growers use, and you can buy that for your home uh, garden if you want to. Um, and I did this um, in January. I made this slide. It's already occurring in Florida. Some of these diseases, like late blight, it doesn't overwinter here, so it has to make its way up through storm events or if transplants are brought up. Um, so we can see it travel up the coast as they start putting tomatoes in further south um, and kind of monitor it. And if it's a hot, dry year, we may not see it develop or if it's like 2009, it developed in June, it was wet enough that uh, by July and August, most of the tomatoes and potatoes were uh, taken out. So as I mentioned, it was a bad year, 2009. It affects the fruit. Here it is on potatoes. Starts out with these small spots, but it can lead to complete uh, loss of the plants. And this is actually what caused the Irish potato famine when they were relying on uh, predominantly the one food source there. And uh, good note to finish up on, there is good news. There's a lot of beneficials out there. If you have a diverse landscape, you can see some of those, um, like this ladybug here. And uh, ladybugs eat plant lice or aphids. They do a great job feeding on those. And you may not recognize this one, but this is a ladybug larva. It is also eating an aphid. They're both voracious feeders, both the ladybug larva and the adults. So if you see something that looks like an alligator on there that has little orange and uh, black on it, um, leave that one alone. That's a good guy. All right, and so I think we'll wrap up with that, and we'll take some questions. Thank you very much, uh, Lynn and Ryan. I think uh, they deserve a round of applause from everybody. I want to thank all of you for coming. We will uh, have time for questions and answers, but this will wrap up our one-hour presentation. And we truly want to thank um, our friends in the P Penfield Cable Television Programming. Uh, they've been a great asset to us in the PGI in, with the Penfield Green Initiative in the uh, programs that we have wanted to present to people who show up at the, the night of the event and to the residents in the town of Penfield so that they can see it in the upcoming weeks. So thank you all and that'll end our, our formal taping.